Good morning and good afternoon to all of you out there. Welcome to this session of the Coyote Logistics Digital Summit. Does your boss speak logistics and how to make your shipping budget make sense? It's a big topic and we've got a great panel uh, assembled for you today. My name is Nick Purcellis and I'll be your moderator for this session. Joining me today are two industry experts who I've had the pleasure of working with extensively at my time at Coyote. Uh, let's start with some quick introductions uh, for the audience. So Pat, uh, if I can start with you. Yeah, Pat Campbell, uh, Chief Operating Officer here at Coyote. I've been uh, working with our customer and carrier partners pretty much since the beginning of the, uh, the company and a lot has changed over the last 14 plus years. And uh, that has only accelerated over the last couple of years. So I think this topic is uh, top of mind for everybody. Great. And, and agreed. Glad to have you here, Pat. Um, over to Rob. If you'd share a quick introduction, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. Good day, everybody. Uh, Rob Haddock with Coca-Cola North America. Uh, been in many uh, logistics planning roles uh, over the decades with the Coca-Cola system. Uh, currently working in the logistics space and representing both North America and working closely with our, our bottling partners around um, the U.S. and Canada. Great. Uh, thanks to you both and thanks for joining. Uh, a couple of quick housekeeping items uh, before we get started. As I mentioned, we are live today, so be sure to stick around for Q&A at the end of this presentation. And throughout the talk, feel free to submit questions. We'll address uh, as many as we can at the end. Uh, that being said, let's get into our discussion. With the events of the past two years, supply chain and logistics have taken center stage in the personal and professional lives of, of consumers. Uh, and of the business world across the globe. And never before has this essential uh, but long overlooked portion of the economy received so much attention. Um, with that new attention, we think has come more and more questions that industry experts like Pat, like Rob, and like many on this call have to answer, oftentimes coming from leaders in the organizations who don't have a background in transportation or logistics. Uh, as Pat mentioned, we felt that there's never been a better time to ask the question, how well do decision makers at your company understand transportation? Uh, and in this session, we're going to get some real life perspective from these two seasoned supply chain exec executives to help uh, frame those important conversations and to give you insights on how to advocate and explain your freight budget both now and as we head into 2022. Uh, so I'd like to start by exploring how the pandemic and all of its implications have changed the conversation between executive leadership, non-transportation leadership, and supply chain professionals. Uh, Rob, let's start with you. What do you perceive to be the biggest shifts uh, in, in that conversation over the past couple of years? Well, uh, Nick, I could go back in time, and, I, and I've been in and out of transportation multiple times over the decades, and I think beginning in 2018 was, was the year that transportation finally got a little more recognition and understanding. Um, not COVID related at the time, but it was tied to drivers and ELD. And, you know, it tends to be a fairly good portion of a cost of goods, but you'd be surprised how little is understood about how transportation works. Um, fast forward to, if you watch the nightly news last night, you know, both two of the major networks talked about a hundred ships off the port of California trying to get into offloading. And, and all of the ripple effect on logistics that is creating. Uh, so, you know, I know millions of people saw that. Um, and you know, how do you translate that into what does that mean to maybe my Christmas gifts under the Christmas tree? Or even if you're trying to move freight anywhere in the country, that's going to be a, a influx of supply and demand on the West Coast, which is going to have a ripple effect across the economy. The um, the leadership and the, and the senior folks and the, even the marketing teams, the business side of things, you know, they're starting to understand that it's, you know, transportation is not just an infinite supply of trucks, uh, that there's, there's a certain universe that the drivers are so critical uh, that the drivers have been, you know, some of the, the unsung heroes throughout the whole pandemic because they've been moving, you know, day in and day out. They've been moving between A and B and C and D to get all commodities uh, to where they need to be, whether it be the over the road, the last mile, the dedicated, you name it. Uh, they themselves and the warehouse operators have been putting themselves at, at risk daily um, just so we could continue to have our quality of life. So I, I think that has been a big uh, component is that 
the, the visualization by the media and constantly explaining has really changed the perception of what transportation does and how complex it is and also how integrated the ecosystem is because you know my the truck i use today or you know the, the coyote truck i use today somebody else perhaps in the cpg industry or another industry will be using tomorrow and as quickly as we can keep that moving the more efficient it is for the whole ecosystem yeah and you and i have talked about that would you say that the frequency of conversations outside of, of the transportation group has has increased as well um, due to all the things you just uh, you just referred to yeah it, it, I think it really does I mean it, it's leadership within supply chain and then it's also leadership across the commercial side of the business uh, you know so the sales the marketing individuals those that have to help explain it to the customer the end customer you know what are what are we doing to ensure that as many of the goods get to where they need to be on the time and date that the customer requested it. Uh, so we're doing, you know, we're doing everything we can to keep things moving, keep the stocks as shelved as, as possible. Got it. Um, you know, one of the great things about this conversation is that we have both the the shipper perspective with Rob as, as well as the carrier perspective uh, with, with Pat on the, on the uh, panel. And Pat, I'd like to turn it over to you. Similar question. Uh, how have you seen the, the conversation shift uh, both in the, the carrier side as well as the shipper side uh, over the past couple of years uh, as it pertains to transportation? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Rob's point is is probably one of the most critical, which is this is a, a front page news um, conversation across all segments, all industries and all professions now. And I think we've seen logistics and transportation make its way to the end consumer through the way that people receive their goods, so they're thinking about it more. And then you layer in, um, really what is put on full display has been the strength of partnerships over the last 18 months, two years. Um, we've worked with Rob and the organization for years now in a very transparent and, and forthright way. And then we also work together on creative solutions, forward-looking solutions, how do we help um, and how do we deliver different value for different businesses within the same company? Um, so as we are able to, to test those in, in real world scenarios and evolve, um, a lot of our partnerships are as strong as they've ever been. The, the conversation of shipper of choice, ease of doing business, uh, how flexible or nimble are you? Um, a lot of those, those um, partnerships that, that maybe were not built around that, that were somewhat one dimensional, um, they really had to evolve and they had to evolve really quickly. And I do think that the conversation uh, made its way into other parts of the organization and got people's attention through different things. The, the labor shortage in particular was not just uh, a transportation challenge. That was something that impacted full scope supply chains, but also just day to day businesses uh, and business units. So really unique to see that conversation type, uh, you know, kind of evolve and, and the different ways in which we kicked around challenges. You layer in on top of that, um, really about three to four years where the North American truckload volatility in a six month time period when businesses, you know, dropped through the floor, like as low as demand as we've ever seen um up through the, the the fastest acceleration over the course of the next two to three consecutive quarters um it just really kind of amplified the the pain and the need for true partners that are are going to to, to evolve with business needs as they as they come in and um scalability and flexibility was on full display so the pandemic really squeezed everybody in in some ways and, and and while that was going on everybody was trying to figure out how to do things in a safe way and a different way than we were all accustomed to so um it was an interesting stretch that's for sure um and i don't think that uh the evolution of partnerships and transparency and finding solutions is going to slow down anytime soon yeah rob and i were, were talking just before the call and if you got a chance to listen to the economic forecasting session uh, that, that uh, was right before this one. The, the consensus is that 22 is going to continue to present those challenges, which is is all the more important to have these conversations 
uh, you know, both together and then uh, for the broader audience. Uh, appreciate those responses. It, it aligns with what we're hearing from our customer teams and, and from our from our carrier partners. Uh, next question for, for both mm -hmm. Rob and Pat. N now that these conversations, as you said, are happening with more frequency and more urgency are in the headlines every day, uh, what are some of the knowledge gaps, misconceptions, or, or things that, that you uh, find yourself explaining uh, more frequently to other parts of the organization or to um, you know other uh, partners and, and constituents that you work with uh, about the transportation industry as a whole? And, and Rob, I'll, I'll start with you again. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that <clears throat> you have these conversations every day and just curious if you see any uh, of those knowledge gaps, you know, reoccurring um, as you as you have those conversations. Well, I think the the thing that is most concerning is the fact that you know the the driver shortage, and you know we thought you know there's driver shortages they come and go uh, they come and go with the economy. Uh, you know, this driver shortage seems to be more um, more difficult to get our way out of, and I think those those people that are have the opportunity to be a driver, they also have the opportunity to be in, in a warehouse or do a last mile job. Or, or you know, President Biden has a very large uh, infrastructure bill, which could lead to more jobs that would be perfect. You know, you're home every night, um, you, you know, better lifestyle, perhaps work-life balance. Uh, you know, the perception is that, you know, the driver, the driver supply was kind of an endless, an infinite supply of drivers out there. So, you know, how, how difficult can it be to get a load covered. Um, and that has not really slowed down. Um, and since 2018, that has been an ongoing challenge. Now, I also heard this in the last discussion, and, and I believe it's true, is that, you know, shipper of choice, Pat, you mentioned that, you know, that's a real thing is important. And if you think, look at the numbers, you know, 15, 15 minutes, 30 minutes of efficiency at both a pickup and a, and a drop-off location, and all of a sudden you've got 30, 40 an hour back to the driver on a daily basis. If you amplify that across the million drivers, how many hours is that? So you almost, if just by getting more efficient, start to close the gap on, on the shortage. Uh, and we've been you know, demonstrating to our, our shipping and receiving locations that, hey, if you can keep this driver moving, it is a good thing for us. It's a good thing for the whole economy. Uh, so that's where we've been really trying to focus is yeah, you know, the drivers want to drive. Let's let's let them let's let them do their jobs. Yeah, and I, I know that uh, that efficiency is something that that you're very passionate about, Rob. Um, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on that more through the conversation. Uh, in terms of of either misconception or knowledge gaps beyond driver shortage and the importance of shipper of choice, uh, any anything else that you you'd add uh, to to that list? Yeah, you know, I think the the other thing that really, um, you know, the, the, just the cost of transportation. What does a single load cost? And if you can't, if you can't fulfill the tender with your primary carrier in today's environment, when you go down your routing guide, it it used to be a marginal difference in the cost to move something. Uh, now it's it's double, or it could be even worse. Um, so you know, the value of really understanding what do you want the carrier to do week in week out you know how many shipments to by lane and geez don't put them all on the same day let's spread them out all of the importance of smoothing out your volume giving your 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 carriers good tactical information as to what to expect next um you know if you are if you're not very good at planning you're probably going to end up paying more so it's it's really critical that you you know not only long-term, mid-term, but what's your next two weeks look like? And if you do have anomalies, volume anomalies that are making their way through the supply chain, uh, you know, talk to carriers in advance before you have to start executing orders. Uh, so, you know, th that's that's some of the misconception that, um, you know, all loads would be covered at the same price. Well, in today's environment, not it's not the case. Yeah, very, very much so. Um, and and I'll, I'll transition to Pat. Uh, love to hear that you build on uh, Rob's comments and then add you know, any any other uh, you know, reoccurring themes that, that you hear in your conversations with both our, our shipper partners and, and carrier partners. 
Yeah, I would say as far as misconceptions um, go, the, the impact of just a single move uh, has an impact on multiple different people with multiple different goals and incentives and performance scorecards and compensation uh, driven metrics behind them. You have, no matter what, you have a shipper and a receiver. You have two different warehouses. You have a, a, a driver involved just to, just just in one move, let alone working through the entire sequence of supply chains or working back in the supply chain and figuring out how things like lead time, uh, really, I mean, a lot of what we do now isn't just moving goods. It's really real-time data sharing. That is top of mind with all the partners that we work with. And and they want to use it because it, it's going to impact the quality of life that the people in every single move have. And that is kind of the evolution, I believe, of shipper of choice, which is really partner of choice. And how do you support our people? And how do we retain those jobs, to, to Rob's point? Um, just the infrastructure bill, um, where is the labor going to gravitate to? How much are we doing to make sure that not only they're, they're paid appropriately, but they're positioned to win and enjoy the work that they're doing? And transportation, in my opinion, is, is kind of a low priority on that list or has been historically. And it's had a really negative impact on the perception of what it means to to work in the in the, uh, the the labor space tied to the movement of goods throughout the the country and throughout supply chains uh, globally. So there's a there's a there's a lot going on um, there. I think that and and Rob would know better than me, but we have talked about it. Um, you know, prior to this call, I, I do think that that conversation has made its way into a different part of the executive uh, meetings at some of the largest companies, largest shippers in the in the world. And it's a good time to put it on full display and and figure out how we solve those yeah. challenges and opportunities together. Um, other than that, I, I would simply say that in the, in the last year to 18 months in particular, um, I think a lot of times at, at, at um, points of extreme volatility um, with some economic uncertainty or booming or, or, or whatever, you know, is going on that the assumption is everybody is being opportunistic and everybody is doing something to really try and, um, you know, boost their own results, regardless of, of the implications on partnerships and long term relationships. One of the things that has had it's been very uh, beneficial out of some of the pain that we've endured is being able to work with our partners and finding out how the pandemic and the 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 economic conditions of the last two years has impacted different segments in different industries. Uh, some driven by e-commerce, but across it, the, the pandemic had a, a starkly different impact depending on which segment of business you were in, what type of goods you were selling, and what consumer demand was going to be for, for that segment. So uh, some customers' business thrived dramatically. They ran into sourcing issues and other supply chain issues, and others uh, stopped for, for short periods of time. So I bring it up because there was an opportunity for people to be very short-sighted in the way that they behaved with their partners. And there was also an opportunity to really solidify long-term relationships. And I think um, I think it's a misconception that everybody was handling those scenarios uh, the same way as far as uh, the partners across the entire Rolodex or, or routing guide um, um, went. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it, and it brings us back to uh, the importance of, of partnerships and, and the transparency that, that you're referring to, uh, Pat, and, and understanding uh, really you know, how the, the whole ecosystem and the whole supply chain uh, has been impacted and continues to be impacted um, from shipment to port to uh, over the road and, and ultimately to, to delivery. Um, Pat mentioned something, Rob, that I, I just want to I want to get from your perspective, what you're hearing um, from your from your peers and in the industry. Uh, that the supply chain, you know, conversation is is in fact, you know, in in the in the boardroom, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. and and that that is uh, that is you know consistent across the the shipping community. Yeah, I mean, I I you know pass on information to my senior leadership, and um, 
you know, they will, they will say, listen, I was talking to my peer over at company XYZ and they're sharing the same information back with me. Uh, so there's a, there's a, at the senior levels, there's a high degree of understanding as to how everything is connected and that it's not individual companies that are struggling. It is, it's an ecosystem that is dealing with this at a national level. Got it. Um, so I think a natural place to go with the conversation then is as you, as you think about what we just talked about, the, the misconceptions, knowledge gaps, um, and the, the <clears throat> presence in, in, the, in the boardroom uh, or you know, at the executive level. I know you both do a lot of guiding and educating uh, leadership at your organization, as well as peers and, and colleagues uh, in other functions, uh, both within your organization and across the industry. Uh, I think that it would be really interesting to hear what you think are the most important things that you find yourself sharing or typically share about uh, the market dynamics that drive the transportation industry. Uh, Rob, I know you and I have talked extensively about mm -hmm. this, but I would love to, to see if you can summarize uh, what you believe is, is most important to share when, when you're in those conversations. Uh, Nick, do you have that, that map document? I do. Do you, want to, do you want to introduce that? I will. I will introduce it. Um, let's see if we can confirm that, uh, that you can see that. Yeah, as you can easily see on this uh, mind map, um, this outlines all of it in, on one page. Um, <laughs> it seems so simple. So simple. You know, all kidding aside, um, we try daily to, to really boil it down to what is it that I need to know. And uh, there's so many different components that um, drive the whole transportation industry. I mean, it's what somewhere north of $800 billion of, uh, of freight is moved uh, on the truck, truckload or intermodal platform. And I, uh, I was off last week and um, great time in Oregon. And I thought, well, I've, I've got to come up with something that is kind of a something on a page that I can talk to. Uh, so I was doodling on the airplane coming back, and, and this is what I came up with. And, you know, it really, it starts with, you know, your bids and what's the difference between your contract rates, primary, secondary spot, all the way down to, um, you know, shipper of choice. What's the market? What's the industry telling you? Uh, everything in between. And, you know, the starting point was to kind of put this little picture down, and then you, we're building out a, a, a document that says, all right, let's talk a little bit about the, the economy. Let's talk a little bit about asset versus broker and the number of owner operators versus uh, asset based carriers, just to give people a general understanding of, you know, a truck is not a truck and the market is, is influenced by not everything that CPG does since we're only 20%, but you've got all these other goods and services that, that, that are requiring trucks to move things around. Um, so this is, this is our attempt to really start getting it down and providing somebody that they can get a document in their hands and they can read through it and they can perhaps at the end have a better understanding of how it goes comes together. And as you go through the documentation process uh, and knowing that this is, this is a, uh, a, a mind map as, as you called it, but a, a window almost into all the things that are in your head about transportation, uh, what where do you start? What what is what is the the place that you think is, is most important to uh, to make sure that that senior leadership uh, clearly understands? Uh, and then if you can kind of walk us down that path, uh, we'll love to get Pat's perspective on both the, the mind map and then the the overarching question as well as we get there. Yeah, interesting, uh, Nick. I think it starts and, and I spent a lot of time in planning. You know, both the transportation space, but then also on the finished goods side and materials requirements. So, you know, if I compare what we do um, on the planning side to drive production and to drive inventory, yeah, you know, we have plans uh, that, that help us stay pretty close to what we want to manufacture. And the, um, the gap is that those plans really have never been translated into, well, what do I need to move from customer A to B? Uh, and how frequently do I need to move it? Um, and, and, I, and I thought that was probably the most important handoff and connectivity with another group that I got to get that volume as, as tight as possible with the best intelligence from all my commercial side uh, to give me a fighting chance. And I got to share that with my carrier partner 
in a time period that allows them to do something with the information. Uh, so I, you know, I think that's probably our most important starting point is just to make sure you got your volume projections right, or if you're making revisions along the way, make sure you're communicating them. And and seemingly then that's the the connection point um, from from the transportation side of that side of the equation with um, senior leadership in your organization that, that there has to be a balance between the two. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because in the in the past, if we were a little bit you know off the number. You know, chances are there would be somebody out there that could haul the freight at a reasonable price. Um, today's environment, and I think going forward, that's going to be much more challenging. Um, if you don't have a good business plan to start with, you're going to have uh, some some struggles. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I know that there's a lot to to go back and forth on here, but I'll uh, I'll just tee it up to to Pat. Um, question, just a, a refresher, is when you're educating and, and and talking to senior leaders outside of the transportation uh, you know industry and transportation uh, you know background and experience what what do you uh, think are the most important points to, to hit home on and I can I can leave Rob's uh, mind map up or uh, if you want to talk to anything on the slide or we can uh, we can just get your get your thoughts here well I'm sure everybody looking at the the mind map is is totally cracked the code and figured it out now so uh, we can just we can just end the we can end the session as uh yeah there there it is um I, I would say i mean you know rob brought up a couple of key points uh the, the the forecast is key i i think sometimes it's a misconception for why the the forecast is so important the assumption is oh it's more predictable you can make more money you could do different things uh with that so that's that's my good uh portion of my network and then I have some some chaos that, that works in, in concert with that. And that's where I really need help. So, you know, as far as the forecast goes, the reason why the forecast is so important for the partners is really um, you can forecast in and in, in dial in your cost to serve. Uh, what are the expectations for Rob and his network? so that we can make sure we design solutions for them and then what isn't predictable and what may come up along the way and how do we design solutions and, and, and um, you know, value for those. So understanding the value that you bring and the different portions of the, the network is really important. Um, but also what, what are our partners relying on us for and what is the balance of, of those different values that they may be seeking. So clarity on that rather than the one size fits all model, I think is, is very much at the forefront of the conversation now. And, and our partners do understand that. And it's also led us to design solutions um, so that we can, like I said, really dial in cost to serve on certain areas where the, the value, and this is where the value is so important downstream. When I said earlier, um, whether it's the warehouse or the or the driver or the the different components that go into the different people that go into making those moves um, they are dependent on each other even though they never really would communicate except for maybe one transaction here or there so how efficient that warehouse might run how efficient the dock schedule is is tied to the time on time performance of the drivers how quickly they turn the drivers out is tied to how how efficient that driver's day is and all of those things have an impact on not only their performance, but their their desire to continue to do the job and, and how enjoyable it is. So I don't think that that's ever been part of the conversation, at least when I went back, you know, 10, 15 years, I, that we definitely weren't talking about how enjoyable the job was to do. Um, it's, it's at the forefront of the conversation now. And then the other is, like I said, what are the different network needs? And there's times when if you take a finished good product that the customer is not super concerned about the cost, it just has to be perfect service. And there's times also when there's a lot of flexibility and they expect us to be able to move that at an incredibly low cost an incredibly efficient and predictable way. And we should be able to deliver on that. So those are just two scopes of one mode of transportation. If you went back to Rob's mind map, there's multiple modes. There's, uh, you know, millions of different geo pairs that are that are in there. There's so much work that goes into understanding what the network is doing today, what it may do tomorrow, the contingency planning, 
um, stealing a word from from Rob that he brought up in our previous conversation. Um, transportation is an unhedgeable commodity in some ways. There's a lot of different things that we would have to work on from a scenario planning standpoint that would just be super time consuming and very expensive. So we have to focus on the main ones, the key ones, and we have to work through the other ones on the fly. And, um, you know, hopefully the appetite to understand why a budget isn't necessarily a budget and staying within budget isn't necessarily a good thing in some cases. I hope that that conversation continues to progress because it will drive partnerships to be more transparent about um, when when we should be able to come in under budget, when we should be able to deliver value back that is less expensive because of what the the, the market is providing us from an opportunity standpoint, rather than the 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 push pull or the squeezing on both ends. Um, it, you know, I, I think that transparency will win as we work these problems and challenges together. There's there's so much uh, that I want to I want to follow up on in there, uh, but quickly. You mentioned a, a really interesting phrase, the, the the unhedgeable commodity. And I know that you and Rob and I have spent some time talking about it. Um, Rob, can, can you share from your perspective what what uh, what you mean when you when you shared that in the in the uh, visual just a few minutes ago? Yeah, yeah I think one of the uh, one of the things interesting about transportation and, and it's you know, if you're if you're making something, you you know, you have a supplier X, Y and Z and they probably supply to a limited number of other customers those certain materials and you know depending on on how markets are going or you know your prices price points per whatever each is widgets you know your your price can become fairly set fairly standard the um the, pat you mentioned you know the millions of different shipping and receiving com com combinations that we have and the 155 different freight markets that are across the country. They all work somewhat independently, but they're all relying on each other. Uh, so to try and, you know, just hedge and say, well, it's going to be X, it, it doesn't, it's not as easy. You can't drive down a price just because you're willing, you're saying it's going to happen. Uh, I think that was one of the other misconceptions that, you know, $800 billion freight market yeah, you know, there's there's nobody that has a, a, a critical amount of freight in the market um, because there are so many different people that are using transportation. And when it's a supply versus demand imbalance, you know, you can say that, you know, the carrier partners can pick and choose who they want to partner with. Um, and unless you are you know, on that shipper of choice list or you're willing to go really deep into your pockets, you may not get the freight that you need. Right. Yeah, I just uh, I thought that was a, a really interesting definition for, for what we all observe and, and wanted to, to build on it. And, and then, Pat, you know, what I, what I heard you saying, and I think you know, between you and Rob is, is, and it may be oversimplifying it, but the importance of the, the transportation group being really intentional about understanding the, the business needs, the forecasting and the production expectations, and then equally, um, you know, the business being intentional about understanding how transportation you know actually functions and and you know where there are uh, trade offs and, and levers that uh, that impact you know the, the overall business outcomes is is uh, you know kind of the summary of, of what we've just been just been talking about, which is I think a, a great point for us to transition to really the second part of this conversation, which is about uh, you know the budgeting process and and a little more uh, to to the the management of uh, you know of of the the freight, uh, you know, for from a shipper perspective, and then you know, with Pat's perspective from a carrier uh, as well. And just want to remind the audience that uh, we are taking questions. We've got a handful of questions in the uh, in the queue, and we'll we'll turn to those here in, in just a few minutes. So uh, as as we make that move, just a quick reminder: um, as you think about the budgeting process and and how that's evolved, uh, you know, either over the past two years post pandemic or, or, you know, in recent memory, uh, I think that it's a, it's a really relevant topic coming off of where we were just coming from, from a, uh, you know, forecasting standpoint, uh, you know, Pat, if, if you could build on uh, how you think uh, the, 
the budgeting process has evolved over the past uh, you know several years and then when we get rob back we'll, we'll pose the same question to him yeah i think it, it ties in with some of the other points that we've made along the way or that we've talked about it's um it's it's, it's valuable information and data um it's it's tying a story to numbers that makes logical sense and can be validated across multiple partners in the network um, so the more information we're able to share, the more communication that we can provide. Um, and this, this ties back with other elements of the, the conversation. Uh, if things are more expensive because there is problematic or challenging facilities in the network down to the facility level, that can have an impact on budget, depending on how volume or how, how high volume and how much uh, you know, freight they may move. So that type of information, that type of transparency is critical when driving the conversation about uh, why costs are increasing and areas of opportunity where volume can be moved around. That's a, that's a more consultative approach that I think has really evolved in the past couple of years. Um, help me understand from the scope of my network where I can potentially move, store, uh, or manufacture goods in different areas to satisfy certain markets that are, are growing or shrinking or product lines that are growing or shrinking. Um, so that's, you know, that's really, that's full scope supply chain. Um, transportation is the maybe the last leg of it, but because we have insights into those costs, because some of those things um, wouldn't make logical sense without truly understanding transportational moves like rob said 155 different regions in the network however many combinations that ends up being um, understanding why those costs are so variable is uh is very basic if you're in transportation and if you live it every day um, it is not so much when that is not the core competency of what you're doing and when it's viewed as strictly a cost center I don't know of any company that we work with that isn't constantly reviewing cost and trying to see what they can do to drive cost out um, while growing market share. So, um, you know, transportation, the budgeting process in and of itself, and then how can transportation be used to grow uh, market share to bring on new uh, new customers or end consumers, those different types of things. I would say in the last two years, at least that's that's the first time I've seen those type of collaborative conversations where transportation, uh, maybe not us, but our partners like Rob have a seat at the table to have that conversation with marketing and sales and other different different areas of the business that are that are revenue growth driven and transportation is is getting an, uh, an opportunity to provide input there and our responsibility is to to give every single possible piece of information and data and insight to our partners so that we can we can grow our partnership and and ultimately um grow in a a, a, a healthy way uh for both companies yeah and I, I think uh the point about you know cost center versus uh i'm paraphrasing but competitive advantage uh is is such a uh interesting theme that's come out of the past couple of years. And I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, Rob, we all have been living in a work from home world uh, and glad, glad you're back. Uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah, I'm relatively close to a couple of schools and I think they turn up their internet requirements in the afternoon. Uh, well, depending, on, depending on what time it is, it's I don't yeah. know, it might be uh, lunchtime. So maybe uh, yeah, any, any number of reasons, but in all seriousness, um, thanks for, uh, for, for finding your way back on what we're, what we're asking. Um, is how has the budgeting process evolved or changed um, you know in light of all the yep. things we've been talking about and and really fascinated to i know you caught the end of the comments from yep. pat but really fascinated to hear uh your perspective from your industry peers uh on on how that's different you know for you all these days yeah i think you know going back to 2018 that was a really a good learning year to how um how much we didn't know um about you know what might be happening next and and really start to plan for all of the worst case scenarios um, so we increased our, our reporting capabilities when it became you know got down to financial and financial performance and also you know tapped into a few more industry uh, guiding industry um, insights economic insights etc just to say okay yeah I know what's happening now I know why what do you think is going to happen 
in three months, six months, a year from now. Uh, so, yeah, that's why I think everybody now is tuned into those economic outlooks and what is it really saying and how do I apply it back to my my budgeting process and even my monthly estimates uh, in terms of what's going to happen in the downhill. Uh, so, you know, looking at 2022, it's, um, you know, it, it's the industry is saying it's going to be this. We can be optimistic and, and kind of hope that it's going to get better. But if you do fall into that trap, you might have a really good looking budget on December 31st of this year. But, you know, by the time you get into January, February, March, depending on when, when the first big obstacle of the industry occurs, you know, it's just a matter of time before your budget may be really under attack. Uh, so we, we throw in everything from, you know, winter storms, hurricanes, natural disasters, plant outages, anything you could think of to say, if these bad things happened, what would it mean from a cost perspective? And can we provide finance with a, a number that they don't have to go back and change week after week or month after month? Uh, and I think there are, most organizations just want to know a real good number they can plan to um, and not have to revise it every month and take money away from other groups to go ahead and you know, pay off the transportation bill. Right. And so many of those factors out there, um, you know, we've, we've lived through any number over the past few years and, and certainly uh, you know, need to be prepared for what we what we can't predict uh, coming next. Um, thoughts on the competitive advantage uh, for, for logistics and, and for transportation? Is that is that uh, a theme that you've been you've been hearing in the budgeting process as well? Where where can we uh, potentially you know, invest? Yeah, in in, I mean, a, a, a lot of customers right now on the retail side are very focused on on time delivery performance. And, uh, and penalties. Um, so, you know, it, it really behooves you to be be there when the customer expects those orders to be there so you can make sure you get your stuff on shelf. Um, and if, you know, sometimes you might have to invest a little bit more to make sure that you have the right level of shelf presence. If you're successful at that, chances are you might, you might end up with a competitive advantage. Got it. Um, well, Good stuff uh, from both of you all. We we want to be conscious of the time because there are some questions that we want to make sure to, to get to for the live uh, participants. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap up with one question. Um, the last thing I, I wanted to touch on is the forward looking from everything we just talked about. Um, you are in the process of educating and explaining the, the nature of the transportation industry to uh, leadership and colleagues and peers. You're setting a budget with expectations, Rob, to your point, trying to set um, you know, a no surprises budget, but surprises happen and, and things mm -hmm. change. Uh, really would like to get both of your perspective on best practices for or experience uh, planning and managing the communication ongoing. How, how do you talk to um, you know, the, the constituents and the folks that, that you need to keep informed along the way and, and any best practices that, that you would share on that front? Um, you know, Pat, I'll, I'll start with you again, and then uh, we'll leave the last word for uh, Mr. Haddock. Yeah, I mean, I, as far as communicating goes, um, I think if you, I think if you, if you move the stuff and you work with as many different partners as as we do, interesting spot uh, being a, a 3PL, um, we offer a variety of different solutions for a variety of different customers with a variety of different needs but as it relates to those partnerships and as it relates to how do we educate uh around us um i would say that trying to make the information relatable um we have a tendency to drive way into the weeds i know that i do when it comes to but you have to understand the way that everything connects and moves in order to truly grasp the challenges at hand and why uh budgets get broken and why um things are not as predictable as maybe people would like and and some of that relates to the concept of how lean and accurate you can get from a manufacturing standpoint in some cases and then this chaos that is transportation it's it's two different parts of the the supply chain that are are critical and they are wildly different in terms of predictability and and troubleshooting and variability and all the different things that can go into uh disruption on either side of those um so 
finding some common ground, finding some relatable metrics, finding something that's important to the other executives in the room um, that that uh, translates well to the way that they manage their businesses is the most successful tactic, I would say, that I've explored. And we've had some opportunities, labor in particular, not just driver shortage, driver shortage, driver age, driver retirement, uh, hours of service. Those are conversations that have gone on for over a decade. And I think that they kind of evergreen shipper of choice a similar thing and then and then things stabilize or we enter a different stage of the cycle and then they go away what's happening right now feels more sustainable and the labor challenges rob outlined uh much earlier in the in the uh panel really are kind of uh, giving us an opportunity to connect the dots because they're impacting that challenge is impacting every single business unit in most of the companies that we're engaged with. So it's a relatable challenge uh, that gives us an opportunity, I think, to advance the uh, the agenda or the conversation around transportation and how challenging and, and dynamic it can be without having to drive people into uh, uh, into the weeds so far that we you know, basically lose their attention. Um, so it's a tactic that has worked quite a bit uh, of late and I think it has more legs to come because of the, the front page news scenario and what Rob was uh, you know, describing in the beginning about global supply chain disruption and, and how um, you know, that's at the forefront of, of the news, it seems, almost every night. Yeah, yeah, the, the relatability uh, is important and, and, and more relatable now, uh, for better or worse, probably for everybody. Um, Rob, last word to you, and then we'll get to yeah. a couple of questions. Uh, best practices or, or uh, advice that you'd share uh, briefly uh, before we wrap up on on how to how to plan and manage that communication uh, on an ongoing basis with the rest of the organization. Yeah, Nick, I think since since the pandemic started, you know, we, some weekly high level updates of the headlines um, are, are help the organization understand where transportation is in terms of covering demand. Uh, and then I know all of us get you know, emails every day about, you know, this article, that article, et cetera, et cetera. And Pat, you mentioned about, you know, you, you could either just pass it on and say, hey, read this, or you could go and say, hey, you don't have to read this article if you, if you don't want to, but here's what you need to know. Here's the one or two things that, that how it affects us personally or as a company, and then maybe pass that on to the to select group. Uh, you know, I could, I could pass on six or seven different snippets a day if, if, if I wanted to, but I know that everybody's overwhelmed with emails as it is. So, you know, hopefully the, the one or two that I may forward on a week, people take a few minutes. And if the headline is right there on that, you know, if your, your inbox says da, 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 you know, they'll take a glance at it and go, oh, okay, uh, I may open this up. So even your, the way you pass it on has to be a little bit of a hook if you want somebody to really read it. Yeah, it's, it's similar to the relatability that Pat was talking about. And, and when we were talking earlier, Rob, I, I was uh, I was surprised by the, the frequency. Uh, but but the reality is that you're sending, you know, weekly, uh, sometimes more than more than weekly internal communications, trying to explain what's happening out there out there in the world and in a relatable way to Pat's point, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um, well, great insights and, and uh, certainly something um, from that conversation that we uh, you know, can all take away from. We've got a few questions I want to make sure that we get to from the virtual audience uh, before our time expires. Uh, so if you uh, both will uh, join me over in the Q and A, um, I'll, I'll get us started with the the first question. Um, what key metrics do you recommend a company use to right size uh, their logistic staff with their freight volume? Um, and there's a there's a, a second question to follow on. Uh, what level of performance uh, do best in class companies expect from their carriers uh, and and their team? So let's break those into into two uh, key metrics uh, that you recommend a company use to to uh, size their their logistics staff accordingly, and then we can we can open up the second one uh, after we get through the first. Nick, the one that comes to mind is, uh, and maybe it's the, the, the processing cost per tender, uh, and it's going to vary, you know, depending on whether you insource or outsource, how much it takes you to execute a tender. Uh, 
you know, that's that's one of the things that we look at to say, all right, I've got X amount of orders, I've got X amount of people, um, I've got X amount of complexity. You know, if I were just to say, what's my cost per order in terms of tender execution, what's it look like? And then, you know, what's my technology cost per order? Uh, because sometimes if you invest more in technology, you can reduce your your human capital um, because now you've automated more of it. So, you know, those are some of the things that, that come to mind uh, in that regard. Got it. Um, and then to the second question, I think we've got a we've got a great uh, we've got a great panel to, to tackle this one. What level of performance do best in class companies expect from their carriers and, and from their team? Um, Rob, again, I'd, I'd love to get your perspective and then uh, you know, pass it over to Pat, because I, I do think that we've got really both sides of the equation here. We are we're very focused on service. You know, our customers expect it because we want to make sure that our, our, our goods are getting to the shelf as frequently as they have to. Uh, so, you know, things like primary tender on time pickup, on time delivery, you know, all of those are so critical for us. And, and we have robust scorecards that help carriers know, you know, day in, day out where they stand on those performance metrics. Um, and, and we're very tough on carriers uh, to make sure that we're, you know, we're understanding if you're not hitting these metrics, what lanes might be causing the problems and let's, let's talk about them and how can we get barriers out of the way. Uh, I will tell you that this year we've, we've relaxed things a little bit um, because there's been so much uncertainty as to where volumes have to go uh, to keep the supply chain balanced. You know, we've, we've given everybody a little bit of a, a relaxation on some of those measures, but still as we're going through the annual bid process, those still play a critical role as we roll into next year's uh, campaign. Got it. Um, Pat, from your experience and, and there's a lot to talk about there, um, thoughts on best in class companies' expectations from, from their carrier partners? Yeah, I would say, you know, it sounds a little cliche, but it, it really depends. Um, and it just, it doesn't depend. We get aggregate scorecards for our performance for Coca-Cola, but our responsibility is to understand what's important from a service standpoint and how, what, what is good look like for different segments of the business, different types of moves. Um, behind every customer that we have, there's tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of their customers that we're moving freight into. And those partners, as Rob talks about earlier, um, having having as close to perfect service as you can to make sure that Coca-Cola is getting their shelf space, that's critical. So those types of moves may differ from other moves that, that Rob also has in his budget and his, his uh, supply chain. And we need to understand and add different types of values at different types of costs based on how predictable they are um, what the lead time is on the moves. There, there's certain expectations that I think customers deserve to have based on the information that they're able to provide their providers. And then you get into the, the three main scenarios, I would say, which are, are cost, uh, tender acceptance, and service, which are top of mind for every partner that we work with. And there's an upstream value that we um, hold with every single move so a move is not a move, a truck is not a truck. There's, there's a lot of detail that goes into each one of them and we need to understand them very in-depthly, um, but at, at great scale. So I would say it depends, um, but also service uh, is becoming more and more important uh, to most customers every day. I think the expectations are, are increasing as far as that space goes uh, relative to where they've been over the last 10 years. Got it. Um, well, we've got, we got a few more questions in the chat. We will not be able to get to all of them, um, but we, uh, we will uh, make sure to, to put some answers into the on-demand uh, version of, of this video that will be posted. I do though uh, want to ask Rob one, one last question that I think is uh, is a great sort of look over the horizon. Um, what supply chain technology should the question from the uh, from the participant is should I be investing in? But uh, I would think for you, what what would you recommend supply chain uh, technology 
to be uh, looking into or investing for the future uh, and advocating for in, in their budget. Yeah, Nick, what comes to mind is, uh, you know, if you think about the process of, of plan, do, check and adjust, you know, if, if you don't have the best reporting tools on either, you know, service or efficiency performance with your carriers or your financial tools are a little bit rough around the edges, take a look at those because you want to know what you spent, why you spent it, and then also look at, all right, what's my forecast? If this trend continues, how do I plan for the downhill? And, you know, and do it in a manner that doesn't cause pain. I caught the manner that doesn't cause pain. And I think we got 90% of Rob's answer uh, before we lost him there. Uh, I think that uh, we are nearly out of time uh, and, and really do want to thank Rob and Pat for their participation and for sharing their time uh, and insights with us today. Uh, and to thank all of you uh, for attending this session of the Coyote Logistics Digital Summit. Rob, you're you're just back. Uh, I am I am well versed in logging into this application. Now. You, you're down. You've got it down. Uh, all, all that you missed was a sincere thank you from all of us at Coyote okay. and everybody uh, on this, on this session for uh, sharing your time and perspective. Uh, to the audience, if you want some helpful resources to learn more about freight markets and get downloadable content to use for yourself, including a recording of this, of this session, you can head over uh, to the topic deep dive section of the event site. Uh, from Rob, Pat, myself, and all of us here at Coyote, thank you all for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thanks all. Be safe. Thank you.